Thank you, everybody, for spending a few minutes this afternoon talking about identifying passive intermodulation sources located in buildings and finding sources outside of antenna systems. What I want to talk about first is established for those of you that have done PIM testing before. One of the biggest issues that we face is, where is PIM cost? Is there PIM coming from the tower site, inside of the tower, in the construction area? Or is there PIM coming from something external to the tower? In other words, when signals are being propagated down the antenna, are you generating those signals in such a way that their product mixes together, the information comes into the receive path of the system, and generates very high orders of intermodulation. But what is intermodulation? It's the effect to the customer is my system does not have good quality audio, video, bit error rate, poor call service, dropped calls, and we use a tester that mimics a base station to create passive intermodulation. Well, we can create it and find out where the problem is inside of the system, but we also need to know where it exists outside. Oftentimes, the tower contractor will take something as simple as a piece of steel wool. They'll take that steel wool, they'll put it right on top of an antenna radar, run the PIM test, and they ask themselves, is that piece of steel wool creating a high level of distortion? Well, if it is, PIM is right here, right at the antenna source. Great way to fix it. You know that it's at the source. Repair the source. Repair the construction site behind it. Everything's fine. But what about when the PIM source is outside of the antenna? What if the antenna is sitting on this roof and it's pointing down to a subscriber base and the antenna has a 30 degree beam width and the PIM tester says your problem is 45 feet away, 50 feet away. Well, is it here, here, or here? I don't know. I need a way to quickly locate that the PIM is not coming from the antenna but is somewhere outside of the antenna. And the way we do that is with a combination of spectrum analysis and PIM testing. So what we do is we generate a base station test. We take two signals, run them up through the system into the antenna. Those signals mix together. When they mix together, the amount of energy that comes in contact with some piece of metal that is not similar turns into a diode. It electrically and RF turns on and becomes active. That energy goes into the base station and causes the problems in a network. Well, when it's outside of the system, we take a spectrum analyzer with a PIM wand, and using fast sweeping and scanning, we capture the information generated by the PIM tester, and we locate exactly where the function, where the problem is located. To do that, if you've ever done PIM testing before, the process for a contractor or a carrier looking to get closeout is fairly straightforward. You choose the right test frequency. Is it LTE, upper or lower? Is it PCS, AWS, WCS, cellular? Once you choose the right frequency matching the system you're testing, you measure the PIM. If there's a PIM problem, you turn to distance to PIM to see, is it outside of the system? If it's outside of the system, you mark the PIM sources. Where are they? What are, what's causing them? This is where we use the PIM hunter. We cover the sources with an RF barrier, something that blocks the PIM from happening. So if there's more than one PIM source, you might be doing this several times. Once you've blocked the PIM sources, does the test pass? If it does, great, record the results. If all the test ports are done, all carriers, report it, get your clothes out and get paid. When it doesn't occur and it doesn't pass, now we've got to go back, re-measure that distance to PIM, and find where the, where the error is located. Well, doing that requires time and money. And oftentimes, we don't have access to the system or a rooftop for more than a certain amount of hours a day. That's a big frustration. The landlords are not going to allow us to hunt for these sources that the carrier says it's causing lots of problems. Well, you know what? I own the building, and I'm going to let you use test for three hours. And after that, you need to evacuate the rooftop because it's not safe. 
So we streamline the process. One technician runs the PIM tester, while another person out on the rooftop takes this PIM wand with a spectrum analyzer set to sample very, very fast energy and walk along the system to see where the problem is. But as a technician, we have things on our body, in our person. We might have a tool belt on. We might have a cell phone, a wallet, change, keys. Those create a PIM source. They're dissimilar metals, and when the energy of two signals hits them, they could become a signal source that compromises quality of the cell service. So we can't be in the middle of the path. We need to be a little bit further away from the antenna, not in the direction that the subscribers are seeing, but away from the antenna so that if it's pointing from the wall to me, I'm scanning here, not here. I'm standing in the middle of the path of RF. It's very important that we don't become a PIM source because we could be chasing ghosts. While we do that, we've got to be careful about safety. Safety is paramount. You're on a rooftop. It's easy to become tunnel visionized, focused on, I've got to find the problem, I've got to fix the problem. Well, you do that and you don't realize I just walked into a high voltage line or I just walked to the edge of the roof. So we talk a little bit about some of the types of antennas, the types of gain, and how far away you have to be. As a rule of thumb, if there's a full power antenna system on a rooftop, you want to stay two or three meters away from the antenna. The reason you want to do that is oftentimes you're wearing RF safety monitors if you're in a high RF environment, but when you're testing for PIM, the tester is pulsing very fast. So an RF safety monitor doesn't accurately measure energy you're being exposed to. But if you are two meters away from the antenna, you're not being exposed to energy that can harm you, even at full power. The other aspect about safety is physically making sure you use the appropriate processes that OSHA certified equipment is being used. That if I am hanging off of a rooftop, I have a tether. I'm lanyarded in so that I don't have to be concerned about falling. If there's a ladder or a stairwell, I've got it properly marked off. Safety has got to be first because we don't want to get hurt. We want to quickly test, produce a result, generate that test result so the carrier can optimize the system or you fix the problem and then move on without injury. How do we do this? We accomplish it with three pieces of physical equipment, some training and technicians behind it. A PIM tester. This can be an Enritsu PIM tester, or it can be a new generation PIM tester that is battery operated. I say battery operated because these use switching amplifiers. If you have an original PIM tester that is AC powered, they weigh about 60 or 70 pounds, and the amplifiers are CW, they're constantly on. We measure a pulsed signal. We measure it using a spectrum analyzer that can sample very, very fast. Your spectrum analyzer has to sample at least 10,000 times a second in order to repeatedly capture the switching signal from the PIM tester. If you have these two components coupled to this antenna, you have a PIM hunter system. And if you've designed antennas or worked in the antenna field, you know that typical antennas are designed to be optimal as they go out, they can broadcast information far away. In our case, we do the reverse. This antenna is isotropic. It's not directional. I can twist it, I can turn it, I can move it in any direction. And as long as I'm close to the source of energy, this probe will couple to that source, give me an alarm, and read the information. So that when I am going along the rooftop, and I see a flange here that's an aluminum piece of flashing. I have no idea if this screw or that bolt or a weld here is causing the problem by using distance to PIM because it, the antenna says I could be anywhere from here to all the way across here. With PIM Hunter, as I scan this area, the antenna is here pointing out. I'm not in the way of the antenna, so I'm not a PIM source. And I'm just scanning all the metallic areas. 
it comes into contact with something. Maybe somebody took a stainless steel bolt and bolted down the aluminum flashing because that's what was handy. And as a carpenter, that's a perfectly good repair. But as a cellular network, that's a source of intermodulation. That's a source of unhappy customers. So Pim Hunter identifies exactly where it is, and then you can put a blanket over it and continue walking until there are no more PIM sources. So where do we find these PIM sources? On traditional tower sites, they can occur any place where you're constructing or securing cables. I've got cables running up the tower. I have a galvanized pole here. I might have some copper wrappings or galvanized wrappings or stainless steel <coughs> clamps up here. Anytime there's dissimilar metal, Anytime there's rust or corrosion, there can be PIM on the tower. So a great application is if you're on that tower top or a rooftop that has a small monopole, I can use the PIM Hunter to isolate another antenna that's faulty, a rusty object, or in this case, a bolt that was the wrong type of bolt. Instead of it being galvanized, it's stainless steel. Yes, sir? Uh, can you drop the wand? only a certain distance before it breaks, or can you talk a little bit about the durability of the wand? So the wand's been tested. Um, the only test in the industry are three foot drop tests. And I realize that if you're a tower person, you're climbing a whole lot higher than three feet. But Anritsu has for years tested all of our equipment to be able to withstand a three foot drop test on all sides of the equipment. So in this case, the wand can be dropped from three feet onto a piece of granite on any angle, as long as it's mounted to a cable. Of course, if it drops on the connector, I'm gonna cause damage to the connector. But the wand itself can be dropped three feet. And we use three feet because that is a international standard for shock and vibration. Have you heard of stories where it's been dropped, let's say from a rooftop, and still was in working condition after it fell, let's say 20 feet or so? Well, we introduced the PIM Hunter only this January. Okay. So the history of customers is probably not adequate enough to generate that. Um, we have had instruments in their soft cases drop 20 and 30 feet and still function. Okay. We don't guarantee it. Again, it's tested for three feet, but we've had instruments literally drop 30 feet and still work. So where else do we find these issues? Well, we're going to find these issues in a lot of different scenarios especially when we're talking about O and I DAS systems. A big frustration in DAS is I've got air conditioning vents, lighting fixtures, cables, plumbing, fire extinguishers that could all be sources, and I need to be able to isolate it. So once you've selected the equipment you're going to use, you're going to set it up. And if you'd like to see a demo, we're actually showing a live demo of this and exactly how it works upstairs. Once it's set up, you can share the setup of the analyzer with anyone who has a compatible analyzer. So all they have to do is turn on the analyzer and set the carrier's limit line. Every carrier has a line that says, if it passes this line, you have a PIM problem, you better fix it. So in this case, if it passes the line, I have a history of that by taking one trace and putting it on max hold meaning I'll record it and always be able to see that it failed at least once. And I'll have a real-time audio alarm and an active trace that's constantly measuring up and down. As I walk with my PIM Hunter, I'm looking for the sound of the beep, or if I don't have that, I'm looking at my screen. Again, I caution you, take all the safety precautions before because we don't want to be walking around looking at the screen. Not that we would ever text and walk, but imagine you're texting and walking, some time ago, there was a woman who texted and walked in Disney. She walked into a fountain and fell in. You don't want that to happen to you, especially if you're on a class trip and you are a monitor or a parent or a teacher. That could be very bad. Be careful. This system is set up to identify PIM fast, efficiently, and cost-effectively. But if we don't do it safely, all of that goes away if you get hurt. So things we're finding in the field. A couple of examples. I had a rooftop situation. This is in Northern California, where the clamp was loose. It's a stainless steel, typical wire clamp. Screw it down, clamp it down, everything's fine, life is good. Except 
when it loosens up due to weather. So typical procedures if you're using a clamp like this might be to take a little bit of paint or nail polish or silicone and silicone the bolt down. Maybe that wasn't done. This clamp was loose. It was loose below the antenna. If you're familiar with antennas, antennas radiate energy. Almost all of their energy goes out to the subscriber and a small amount goes back. Well, in this case, the small amount of energy that went back, not to the subscriber, hit the bracket. The bracket vibrated, created a diode, caused PIM, caused the failure of the network. Where else do we see these issues? Rooftops. Not just what you can see, but what if the underlayment, the tar, the concrete, had some water seep underneath it, and underneath here on the floor was a rusty bolt in the path of the antenna that caused PIM. Distance to PIM told us the PIM is outside the system 30 feet away. You walk 30 feet away, everything is clean. You take out your PIM hunter, you start scanning the ground, and lo and behold, an alarm goes off on the floor. You can't see anything beneath the tar paper, and you certainly can't lift up the tar paper. The landlord will probably evict you and take your tower down. So we need a method to identify the obscure PIM, the problem that I can't see, the problem underneath the roof. We can't do that with distance to PIM or range to fault. You need an active monitoring system. You need an active monitoring system when you're in a stealth site. Does anybody install or deal with stealth applications? So in a stealth application, of course, one of the most important attributes is I want it to fit within the community. So this second tier fits within the community because it looks like it's part of the building. So we spend a lot of time aesthetically making sure it matches. Except when you have a problem where there was a bolt. On the opposite side of the stealth panel, outside looks beautiful. On the opposite side of the panel, there was a bolt sticking out that became electrically active, causing PIM. So putting a PIM blanket on it significantly dropped the PIM. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Two minutes. Okay, thank you. I, I don't think I need more than two minutes. In summary, <laughs> um, the PIM Hunter is designed to accomplish a few different things. The most important is speed your time to test and time to identify the problem, help you mitigate the problem faster, and set up so that the carrier model can be turned up, turned on, RSSI pass, KPIs pass, and everyone is happy. Again, anyone who wants to see information about PIM Hunter is more than welcome to come up to the Enritsu booth, and we'll be there all day. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks.